everybody, today we're gonna to talk about confidentiality in therapy. What are your rights? Now, before I jump into today's video, I just wanna remind you to turn on notifications. I've been hearing from many of you that you're not getting notified that my videos are getting released on the Mondays and Thursdays that I release. So if you go to my home channel page, you can click that little bell button to make sure that you don't miss out. But now let's jump into today's topic. Before I talk about all the different caveats of confidentiality and therapy, I want you to know that your privacy and confidentiality is taken extremely seriously. Even in school, it was something that we were harped on and like we had intense testing, not to mention my licensing exam. So know that it is important in therapy for you to feel safe. And we as clinicians understand that. And so part of it is holding your confidentiality, knowing anything that you say in therapy for the most part is held in confidence and won't be told to anyone else. But I'm gonna walk you through any of the reasons that we might break your confidentiality and what happens if we're over 18, under 18. So let's get into it. The first is that when you come to your first appointment, I'm just looking at my notes so I make sure I run through these. When you come to your first appointment at a therapist's office, they will have paperwork out. And one of those is informed consent. And this will talk about all their privacy policies and confidentiality, the limitations of it. So make sure you read that and you can actually ask for a copy. They should really give you one. I always offer up another one for my clients to take home and read and keep, but make sure that you're informed. Make sure you read through that so you fully understand their privacy practices. And if you have any questions, you can always ask them like, hey, are you gonna tell my parents X, Y, Z? So that you know where you stand before you divulge any information that you don't want others to know. Now, like I said, almost all things are held in confidence, but there are some reasons that we have to break confidentiality. And I know many of you can probably already guess these, but the first is if you've signed a release. Like if you are my client and you're seeing a psychiatrist, I'm gonna have you sign a release so I can talk to that psychiatrist. I personally always let my clients know what I'm gonna talk to them about, and I double check with them that that's okay, because I want you to know that it's because I want to help you that I'm doing this. And I wanna make sure that you're comfortable with everything I'm sharing. And if your therapist doesn't do this, you can always ask, hey, I signed that release for you to talk to my EMDR therapist. What are you two gonna talk about? So therefore, you know what information is gonna be shared and you can feel comfortable with it. The second is, and this is one I've talked about a lot, is danger to self or others. If we worry that you are extremely suicidal and we've gone through the certain steps, like I've told you, there are certain steps we're supposed to take, like talking to you about it, creating a safety plan, doing 24 hour check-ins, um, letting you know that we're gonna be calling a close friend or family member who can check in on you to make sure that you're safe before we then maybe uh, put you on a 5150 hold and place you in the hospital for your own safety. And the other is if you're homicidal, if you've talked to us about someone, we know the person, you have the means, you're talking about when you're gonna do it and we feel the threat is imminent, we may have to call the police and make sure that that person is kept safe. So those are kind of the danger to self or others and why we would have to break your confidentiality. The third is abuse. We've talked about this a lot, but if you're under 18 and someone is abusing you, I am legally mandated to report it, meaning I'm gonna to have to break your confidentiality and share what I know with CPS, uh, meaning Child Protective Service, Services, or whatever service there is in your area to make sure that you are kept safe. And abuse can be a lot of different things. I think a lot of people don't understand the fact that abuse isn't just physical. It can, it can be physical, it can be sexual abuse, it can be emotional abuse, and even neglect. Neglect is one that people don't talk about a lot, but if they don't, like let's say a parent doesn't take you to the hospital or the doctor when you're sick, that's neglectful. Or if you have, you should have gotten stitches and they didn't do it or they're not feeding you, there can be a lot of different ways that parents can neglect their children or just leaving children at home alone. I've had to call some of those in when I worked at a clinic downtown because my client was eight years old and was left at home for days on end to kind of fend for herself. And that isn't okay. And that's something that I have to report. And abuse also covers adults like dependent adults and elders. And that means, dependent adult means that even though we're over the age of 18, we're not able to care for ourselves and we depend on someone else to do things for us. So if they abuse us or neglect us in any way, I have to report that as well. And also elderly abuse. If you're over the age of 65 and someone is neglecting you or taking your money and not buying the things that you need, not taking you to the doctor, any of those things, physical abuse, emotional abuse, any of that, I have to report that as well. And the fourth and final reason that I would have to break confidentiality is if I receive a court order. I luckily, knock on wood, have not had to do this in my private practice. However, if your mental health or a mental illness is brought into question during legal proceedings, then I can receive a court order and be forced to come to court and to share a little bit about what we're working on as it relates to that legal case. 
This I've heard from my uh, other colleagues of mine that this has happened a lot in divorce cases. This can happen when someone is quote unquote made you know legally insane, like if they've committed a crime. But luckily, like I said, I haven't had to deal with it, but that would be another reason that I would have to break confidentiality. Now I'm gonna talk about some of the most commonly asked questions about confidentiality. And I'm gonna link in the description to an APA, meaning American Psychological Association, to a link in an article that they put together that I thought was really great that kind of breaks it all down. So if you want more information, you can click that link. But the first question that I wanna answer is, do insurance companies see all of my information? Does my therapist give them all of the stuff that we're working on in therapy? And the answer is no. They do, however, see diagnoses. As you know, we have to use the DSM codes and the ICD-10 codes to get reimbursed from insurance. It's not important that you know what those acronyms mean. It pretty much just means that if you struggle with major depressive disorder, your insurance company will know about it. And they also will know to what level of severity and potentially portions of treatment planning, but they're not gonna know everything that you say in session. You're just gonna know what they need to know to make sure that you can get coverage. And the second question is, will my employer learn about what happens when I go to therapy and get my mental health records? And the short answer is no. Your employer is not gonna get any of that information. Um, through insurance companies, they don't share anything with employers. However, if your employer does offer an EAP, an employee assistance program, which pays for therapy and usually makes it free for you for a certain number of sessions, they may have the therapist fill out a really short questionnaire. But trust me, it's very simple. It doesn't share much. All that it, they're really asking in the questionnaires, at least from my experience, is can you still do your job? And the most common question I get is, I'm under 18, are my parents gonna know everything about therapy? Now, the, every state has different rules and regulations around the age that you can go to therapy without parental consent. And like I've said before, um, I think in California the age is 13, but some are 12, some are 14, it's always around that age. But in order for us to see you without parental consent, that means that you have to be able to pay for it yourself, you have to be able to participate in therapy fully, meaning just like you're developmentally there where you can actually get something out of therapy. And there has to also be a real reason for not including your parents. And I know a lot of you are scared that, hey, they're gonna tell my parents about self-injury or they're gonna tell my parents that I have suicidal thoughts. The one thing that I would encourage you to do because each person's gonna be different and legally, we can tell your parents whatever we deem appropriate. And I want you to understand that, that it's therapist to therapist on what we really feel we need to tell parents. But overall, we are going to share things that we think could put you in danger. That meaning suicidal thoughts, which if a therapist doesn't fully understand self-injury, they could put that in that category. Also drugs and alcohol, a lot of therapists will always tell parents about that because it can put us in really risky situations if we're underage. How are we getting the substance that we're using? Are we putting ourselves in kind of dangerous, sketchy situations to get it? It's possible. And the third is sexual promiscuity. I know that a lot of clinicians will share with parents because it can be really dangerous. We can get an STD or become pregnant and those are things that can be really frightening and dangerous for us and so therefore they will break your confidentiality and tell your parent. But the thing that I would encourage you, if you're under 18, you're seeing a therapist, like I said at the beginning, ask them about their privacy policies. Ask them what they're gonna share with your parents. Make sure that you let them know you want to talk about it before they tell your parent. Have a conversation because I find as long as we're talking about it and communicating about it, there won't be any surprises and we won't come home to a bomb being dropped where our parents are like, oh, I heard you've been having sex with your boyfriend and you're like, oh my God. So talking to your therapist first, understanding where they, where they lay in different issues and what they're gonna share and not share is really important so that you can go to therapy, be honest and open and get the most help. And another important topic to discuss is if you are over 18, therefore you're legally an adult, but you're on your parents' insurance. <gasps> what are they gonna find out? Are they gonna send things in the mail? I've had clients literally run to the mailbox every time the mailman comes to ensure that no information is given to their parents. And the truth of it is, at least in the States, if you're on their insurance, they're going to get what is called an EOB, an explanation of benefits. At the end of roughly each month, it's usually like two weeks into the next month when they finally send these out, but they come to your parents' house or whoever's address is on the insurance form to explain why things were covered or not and what was covered, et cetera. It's not a bill, it's just an explanation of benefit. And those EOBs will go to the person who pays the premium for that insurance. And lastly, 
a privacy thing that I don't think gets talked about enough and it's something that either will happen on accident and then we'll have to talk about it or I personally try to bring it up with my clients is, what if you see me in public? <gasps> Frightening, right? But if you live in a small town, even in a big city, you might run into your therapist at the grocery store. You might run into them at a concert. Who knows, you might be at a children's event, a ballet or something, and there they are. What do you do? As the client, this is what's important to remember. As a client, you hold your confidentiality, meaning I will never take action to break that. You have to say hi to me first. The reason for that is because what if I come up to you and I'm like, oh, hey, Sarah, so good to see you. If you have friends around you or anyone around you, they might be like, oh, how do you know her? Who is she? Then there are questions that you have to answer and that puts you in the position where maybe you don't know that person that well and you don't want to tell them you're in therapy or whatever. So I will never approach you. However, as a client, you can definitely approach me and you can say hi and I can say hi because that's you letting me know that you're okay with people in public knowing that we know each other. I think that's important to note because often this happens when we haven't talked about it and all of a sudden we're like, oh my God, oh my God. Like I've heard from a lot of you that you like hid from them because you're like, shit, I don't know what to do. What am I supposed to say? So that's where we stand on that. I hope you found that helpful. I know there are so many questions about confidentiality and what are our rights, but know that overall you hold the confidentiality and we as clinicians take that very, very seriously. That's why truthfully, I share the least amount of information that I can at all times, unless it's something that you want me to share or unless we've talked about it and we think it's really important to your treatment. And overall, if you have any questions or concerns about it, ask your therapist. It's okay, it's your confidentiality and your privacy and we take it very, very seriously. And please share this video. I know a lot of people have questions about it and don't really understand. So hopefully this helped clear it up. If you have any other further questions, let me know in the comments. But today's video, as all videos, is brought to you by my Patreon patrons. I see you donating every month to the channel to make this channel possible. It's because of you that I can continue doing what I love and we can, as a community, can continue breaking through the stigma of mental illness. And if you're new to my channel, click here to subscribe, turn on those notifications, and I will see you next time. Bye.